Now, here's the next one. Life is worthwhile if you care. It's worthwhile if you learn, it's worthwhile if you try, it's worthwhile if you stay, and it's worthwhile if you care. And I wrote this little phrase that I gave in these talks to service clubs. Here's what I said. If you care at all, you'll get some results. If you care enough, you could get incredible results. If you care at all, you'll get some. But if you care enough, you can get unbelievable results. So the key, I'm sure, of people who spend this kind of money and this kind of time searching for ideas for the future, you are the people who would do that. Not just to care, just to care at all, but to care enough. To care enough to make a difference. To care enough to turn somebody around. To care enough to start a new enterprise. To care enough to change it all. To care enough to be the highest producer. To care enough to set some records. To care enough to win. So that was my little talk to service clubs when I first got started. Right? That's how I started. Communication wasn't that easy for me when I first started. My first little talk in this little business Mr. Schoff invited me into, my first little talk, I stood up, my mind sat back down. Right? I opened my mouth, nothing came out, and my knees were banging together, and sweat pouring off my face. It's called terror, in case you haven't tried it. Right? But guess what I did? Jot this down now. This is the secret to success. I got up and did it again. Even though I was scared to death, I got up and I did it again. And that second one wasn't too good, but guess what I did? I did it again, and I did it again. And I worked up my courage, and I did it again. I committed to it, and I did it again. And finally, it got to be a little easier. I got a little more acquainted with the art. Incredible. So have something good to say, preparation. Here are some words to help you in preparation. Jot these down. To prepare to have something good to say, keep a keen interest in life and people. Don't let your senses go dull here. Guess what most people are trying to do? Get through the day. Here's what I'm asking this unusual audience to do. Get from the day. Get from the day a clear picture of the drama of human life, some doing it right, some doing it wrong, some gathering in, some throwing it away, some building reputation, some letting it all slide. Get from the day what's happening in politics, right? Read the newspapers, read the magazines, find out what's going on. Get from the periodicals, get from the day, get from what's happening. Get from your job, get from your career, get from the people around you. What's happening in the community? Get all of that. The positive side, the negative side. My parents used to say, attend everything. Some things are so costly, it might be a little out of reach for a while, but Andrea Bocelli came to Beverly Hills. Guess what the tickets cost? $2,500 for a two-hour performance. That's pretty good pay. So some things might be out of reach, but whatever you can go to, get to. Save up the money and go. Save up the money and go. So that you'll be more aware of what's going on around you. Keep up that keen interest in people. Why do they do what they do? How come things are happening today that didn't used to happen 30 years ago? Okay. Now the next word is fascination. To be fascinated with life and people and the drama that's live and in color every day. Cinemascope. Fascination goes a little bit beyond interest. Interested people want to know, does it work? Fascinated people want to know, how does it work? Kids have this unique ability to learn several languages in a six, seven year period. And the reason is because they're so fascinated. They're so interested. They're so curious. Kids have to know. And that's how the drama of their learning takes on such speed in such a fairly short period of time is because of this unusual interest and fascination and curiosity. You know, we're walking on ants and kids are studying them. Said, so don't walk on these ants, I'm studying them. How come an ant can carry something bigger than he is? That's a good question. They must be unbelievably strong if they can carry something bigger than they are. 
Here's what else I've learned. To be fascinated instead of frustrated. It's just a little trick to play. The next time you're tempted to be frustrated, see if you can't turn it into fascination. Instead of a frown, it puts a smile on your face. Now, sometimes you look a little weird, but so be it. He says, how can he smile? I don't know. It must be somebody different. Babe Ruth, the home run king, right? Back in those days of baseball, used to strike out, come back to the bench smiling. They used to say, babe, you just struck out. How can you smile? He said, I'm just that much closer to the next home run. Just stick around. Won't be long. One will be sailing over the fence. So you find it fascinating instead of frustrating. Just try it. Just try it. I've learned. In Los Angeles, I'm on the freeway headed for the airport. My airplane leaves in 45 minutes. The traffic's moving, not one inch. I'm now fascinated. I'm telling you. I've learned how to do it. Now, make this note. It doesn't work every time. I mean, nothing works every time, but every time you can get it to work, guess what? It'll benefit your day. You'll get more from it to be fascinated instead of frustrated. Now, I've also learned the ultimate. I'm fascinated by my own frustration. How come it doesn't take me long to lose it on occasion? It must be from my father's side. My mother was a gentle soul. Just find it all fascinating. I talked to a lot of the network marketing companies over the years, and I, I give them that little clue. Somebody joins, you say, oh, they're going to stay forever, and then they leave right away. You have to say, isn't that interesting? And some of you thought never would make it. Sure enough, they become superstars. You have to say, what? Isn't that interesting? I thought they'd stay forever. They don't stay. Isn't that interesting? I didn't think they would do anything. Look what they're doing. Isn't that interesting? So that's a good phrase. Just find it interesting. Find it fascinating. Say, wow, I never thought that would happen. I had another picture in mind. Wow, was I ever wrong, right? And it's good sometimes to be wrong on the positive side. I didn't think it was going to work. It worked. Say, what if somebody doesn't look at your business opportunity? Say, well, what if they do? I mean, it doesn't take much to turn the question around. Say, what if they won't join after they look? But what if they do join? What if they join and don't stay? I got a better question. What if they do stay? What if they quit after three months? I got a better question. What if they stay after three months? So sometimes little tricks here that you can play just to give yourself a different look because they, somebody could either stay or leave. And wouldn't it be better to assume that they would stay and then if they leave, say, isn't that interesting? I've learned to do that with myself. Wow, look what I did. Isn't that interesting? Wow. I thought I was going to behave better, but wow, I lost it. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I thought, sure, that wasn't going to bother me. Sure enough, I thought I had a handle on this. Looks like I got some work to do, right? You just find yourself fascinating and interesting as you journey through life. So give yourself a chance. Now, here's the next word that's very important if you want to be a good communicator, and that's sensitivity. Sensitive to someone's drama, someone's trouble, difficulty. As you contemplate your own, now you can be sensitive to someone else. And there's no better way to be helpful than if you do your best to try to understand. Here's the old phrase. We've heard it. Let's jot it down this time. Learn to walk in someone's shoes for a while. Try to understand where they are. How come they're in this dilemma? Maybe it's something that I don't know, I don't understand. How come this person is losing his temper when he should keep it? Who knows what might have happened the last three weeks? I don't know. Let's give somebody room by trying to understand. Sensitive to someone lashing out, being difficult at the time. Hey, we can handle that. We don't have to retaliate and fight back. Can't we say, hey, maybe there's a good reason why this person behaves in this way? That's an easier way. Sensitivity. Trying to understand. Trying to comprehend the full drama of human experience. Trying to understand the necessity of war. 
We've been through quite a century, the 20th century, a bloody century. We're all hoping that the 21st century will not have such tragedy as World War II, World War I, Korean War, Vietnam War, and the decade and the century before the Civil War. Surely we've had enough of war. Surely we can settle things by reasoning together rather than resorting to conflict. But being sensitive to someone else's point of view, being sensitive to someone else's, the reason they think like they think, the reason they do what they do. Let's see if we can't get behind the scene and try to figure that out. One of the greatest phrases in all the Bible said, blessed are the peacemakers. Guess what a peacemaker is? Someone that we hope is around when the conflict could be resolved. Someone who understands both sides and brings them together. Say, I know you've got some animosity and I know you've got some, but now that you've fought and it's, you know, that's not going to settle it. Couldn't we get together and reason this whole thing out? So in times of conflict, we look for a peacemaker and the peacemaker has to understand both sides of the issue. Say, I understand your dilemma. And I can see where you're coming from. And I can understand why you would say what you said back then. And you said what you said. But hey, isn't there a better way? Couldn't we find a better way to settle it all? And that's what we're looking for. Parents have to learn to be peacemakers. When there's two sides to the issue. And maybe neither one is that far wrong. But to try to settle it. And in order to do that, we have to understand both sides. We have to understand the feelings on both sides. And that kind of sensitivity now gives us a wonderful opportunity to grow so that we can communicate and our words will be meaningful when the test comes and the drama comes and the time comes to step up and speak or to sit down and speak or to be quiet and speak or to be loud and speak. Whatever that might call for, we'll be prepared if we do have a genuine understanding. How come in Northern Ireland the Protestants and the Catholics can't get along? I mean, why fight over religion? Someone says, well, mine's important. Well, sure. The other one says, hey, you don't know how important mine is. And we say, finally, look, even though we disagree, couldn't we agree to disagree, but not kill each other? But unless you really know the conflict and the depths of the conflict and the roots of the conflict and how far back it goes and the animosity on both sides, I'm telling you, it is real strategy to try to keep things in balance and keep the ship from sinking and try to resolve the conflict. But it calls on the greatest of communication. So jot this word down. It's a very important word in political circles, diplomacy. Diplomacy is having this sensitivity to the wider range of why people do what they do and why the conflict occurs and then come up with an answer. Diplomacy, big D, diplomacy. Not start another war, not start another conflict, but try to settle it to the best of your ability using the best art of diplomacy. Next, to have something good to say, you've got to have working knowledge. This is where your journal comes in. This is where gathering ideas comes in. This is where the notes you're taking this weekend come in. This is going to serve for you an incredibly good resource to go back, study, review, and pick up all these ideas that can be useful to you when you get ready to talk, when you get ready to speak, when you get ready to train, when you get ready to conduct a seminar, a lecture, or family council. You'll have something good to say. So don't be lazy in language. Don't be lazy in gathering up ideas. I know it's hard work, but it's work that pays off so immensely. So that's number one. To achieve good communication, have something good to say. Now we've got to move on. Here's number two. Now you've got to say it well. Just because you know something and have plenty to say, now it's very important how you say it. Here's what we teach in sales. It's not so important what you say as how you say it, how you deliver the message. Key phrase, the manner in which you talk about the matter. Sometimes it's the manner that wins the day. Not just the matter, but the manner.
What if I invited you to a steak dinner at my house and you sat down at the plate, had the napkin in your lap, and you were ready? But I backed up to the other side of the dining room, picked up this steak now that's well done, you could smell it, and it is ready to go. And I wind up like a big league ball player and let you have it right in the face. Isn't that one way to present a steak? So key phrase now, steak in the face. It, it's difficult for someone to say, thank you very much, take the steak off the face, put it in the plate and eat it. I'm telling you, I'd lose my appetite. Somebody did that with me. So it's a lot different now, a steak in the face and a steak well presented. Same steak. Somebody's hungry. You got the message. You got the steak. But key phrase underlined, the manner, the manner in which you deliver the message. The way, the spirit, the sincerity, all that human stuff that we all possess, if that is present in the delivery, now it becomes palatable. Now it becomes reasonable in presentation. Now saying it well is many things. Jot these down. Number one, repeating it until you can say it well. Repetition is the mother of learning to do it well. This is my 39th year. I should be pretty good by now. This, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Should be. And I, I intend to get better. I don't want the day to come when someone says, you should have heard Jim Rohn 10 years ago when he was really terrific. I want someone to say, hey, I heard him 10 years ago, but you should hear him today. Hey, he's taken off some of the sharp edges. He digs a little deeper in his own heart and experiences and delivers it a little softly. Or he used to be a little harsh. I want my growth to be obvious. So learning to say it well is practicing until you get good at it. Here's some other keys. Sincerity. If you present it with sincerity, it's hard to resist a personal appeal. A key that parents need to learn, making a personal appeal. Don't just say it's this way or the highway. Say no. Make a heartfelt personal appeal. I'm telling you, it's difficult for any of us to turn down a heartfelt, sincere personal appeal. That's difficult to resist. That's difficult to dismiss. Somebody coming on to beat you up and, you know, create cruelty with their language, that's easy to dismiss. Not a personal appeal. Here's a few other things on saying it well. Brevity. Now, the better you get, probably the, least, the, the less words you need to say what you want to say. We learn to be brief in presenting an idea. If it takes two hours to present one simple little idea, that's, a, that's too long. You've got to learn to use what we call the economy of words. Say it in a sentence. Say it in a couple of sentences. Say it with a couple of illustrations and move on. Brevity. Jesus was powerful, but he was brief. To put his 12 disciples together, he wandered around the countryside. Every once in a while, he'd say, you, follow me. See, that's short. I mean, that... That's brief. This is no one-hour sermon harangue. No. A simple invitation. You, follow me. And I guess his magnetism was so unbelievable. His persona was so unique. And probably his reputation that preceded him was so great. He didn't have to say much. So jot this down. If the person you are is so unique, you probably don't have to say very Now, one of the ways to learn to be brief is to talk to kids, because they don't have long to listen. You talk to kids for 30 seconds, and they say, how long is this going to take? I mean, they got games to play. they got places to go. I mean, they can't hang around for an hour and listen to some long discourse. So, brevity, brevity. Now, here's a couple of other things. Style. Try to develop your style. But here's one of the ways now to develop your style. Be a student of style. Some people that learn to speak up a little stronger, you say, hey, I need, to, I need to learn to do that. Speak up a little stronger because I see how effective it is. Not just to be loud, but just to be a little stronger in your presentation. Maybe learn to express with your face, right? 
Open up your eyes and express a little more on the outside what's on the inside. Gestures might be helpful. Frank Sinatra was the master of phrasing and timing and lyrics and the passion that he put into his singing. But one of the artful things about Sinatra's presentation was always the gestures, right? His hand gestures as he gestured, which, which timed with the lyrics, the gestures as part of the lyrics became part of his style. Now, you don't want to just, you know, let the gestures be the major thing everyone sees, but just to emphasize. Right? If you've let your temper fly, it wouldn't hurt to bang on the table. It's called exclamation point. Bam! When the time calls for it. Okay? Gestures, a little more of you into it. Now, here's the next one. And Zig Ziglar talked a little bit about this, and that's vocabulary. You've got to have a good working vocabulary to be able to speak well. Some friends of mine took a survey among prisoners. They weren't looking for this. They had some rehabilitation program going. But here's what they found out. The more limited the vocabulary, the more tendency to poor behavior. Interesting. Here's why. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. What if you can't see very well? Imagine the mistakes you would make every day if you couldn't see very well. Not just seeing with your eyes, but seeing with your mind. What if you looked at everything a little distorted? Then you tried to make decisions during the day, where to go and what to do and what to restrain and what to let go. And if you made those mistakes every day, can you imagine how small a world you must have to live in by making such horrendous mistakes every day? And the reason why people make so many mistakes every day, especially sometimes in those early years, is because they can't see very well. What if you could only see the world through this little tiny hole? And somebody would describe the world as like this, and you say, no, the world is like this. You say, no, that's crazy. The world is like this. How come they think it's like this? It's because that's all they can see. They can't see expanded opportunity. They can't see the promise of the future. They can't see the hope for tomorrow. Their world is so small. Part of it is lack of exposure. Part of it is lack of association. But part of it is a limited vocabulary, limited tools with which to see. Here's the next one, limited tools with which to express. And if you can't express very well what's going on in your head, let alone your heart, you can imagine the mistakes you make. You can imagine the narrow, small world you live in. Finally, you only need a place eight by ten to live because your world is so small from lack of sight. So keep working on your vocabulary. Next, in saying it well, don't fail to say it because you need the practice. Got a good phrase for you. We've heard the phrase, words are no substitute for action. I got another good phrase for you. Action is no substitute for words. Practice saying things well. Men probably need a little more coaching on this than women. Women seem to be able to express better, say things better, more readily willing to talk. Talk about it, talk about it. Men need a little more encouragement. Don't let some act do all your talking. It's okay to give someone flowers, but flowers have a limited vocabulary. About the best flowers can say is, you remembered. That's about it. Flowers don't say, nobody in this world affects me like you do. See, that you have to put in the little card along with the flowers. So did you make the note? Don't let flowers do all the talking. You've got to add the little card. Express something yourself. Long after the flowers are gone, the card will stay with what you've said. When I was married to Judy, she gave me this fabulous watch for my birthday. And the watch was fine. But the words on the back that said, my love for all time, your Judy. See, that... Those words were more valuable than the watch. I've still got the watch. And what's valuable to me is not that I've kept the watch. What's valuable to me is that I've kept the words. Wow. So don't fail to say it. Practice. 